Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Dan Friedel. And I'm Katie Weaver. This program is aimed at English learners. So we speak slowly and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, we have tips for English learners who want to improve their vocabulary. A lesson from Ana Mateo about how to describe someone who is a bit clumsy. And the next part in our series on America's presidents. But first... A new study has found that dolphin mothers use different sounds to communicate with their young than those they use with adults. The research suggests that the use of the special sounds is similar to the way adult humans use so-called baby talk with children. Female bottlenose dolphins change the tone and length of their whistle when calling and communicating with their young, the study found. Male dolphins do not play a big part in raising young. The so-called signature whistle is an important part of communication for dolphins. Researchers say changing the whistle tone permits female dolphins to signal their young that the communication is meant for them. Scientists say the signals are similar to humans calling someone by name. The research team recorded signature whistles of 19 mother dolphins living in the Sarasota Bay area along the western coast of Florida. The research was carried out over a period of more than 30 years. A study describing the findings was recently published in Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Scientists do not know exactly why people, dolphins, and other creatures use baby talk to communicate with their young, but they believe it may help the young learn many important sounds. For the dolphin study, the researchers centered only on the signature call, so they do not know if the animals also use baby talk for other communication or whether it helps their young learn to talk as it seems to do with humans. Another possible reason for using different tones is so the dolphin mothers can catch the attention of their young, said Georgetown University ocean biologist Janet Mann. She was not involved in the study. It's really important for a young dolphin to know, Oh, Mom is talking to me now, Mann said. I'm Brian Lynn. Let's look at two English learners. One knows about 500 words and understands how they are used in a sentence. The other knows about 1,000 words but has some problems with grammar. Which person can understand and communicate more in English? Clearly, it is the person who knows 1,000 words. Some studies have shown that for learners to fully understand a written work, they need to know 95% or more of the words in it. That means that if there are only five or more words you do not know in a 100-word text, you might not really understand it. 
In today's program, we will give you some advice for building up your vocabulary. Vocabulary can mean a single word, two words such as phrasal verbs, or many words together, such as an expression. There are two important things to keep in mind when trying to learn new vocabulary. First, connect new words to a story or a situation. This makes it easier to remember vocabulary than studying words from lists. Second, be active, not passive. Make yourself use the new words. Here are some ways to do that. When you find a new word or expression in a story, Repeat the sentence and think of the situation connected to the new vocabulary. Write down, then repeat in your head three to five more sentences that use the new vocabulary. Make your own short story and include several new words you want to remember. Each time you retell the story, you will review the new vocabulary in your mind. Make yourself explain the new word like you are a teacher. This is a great way to test how well you understand and can use the vocabulary. And if you have a study partner, you can explain the new vocabulary like you are a teacher. It is better to learn just a few words in a group of related items instead of all the words in the group. For example, if you try to learn the names of 12 different birds, you will certainly mix up which name goes with which bird. But if you simply learn the names of two or three birds, and then learn a few more at another time, you will remember more easily. Learn how a word can be used as different parts of speech, such as a noun, verb, adjective, or adverb. Here are examples of the word hope used in four different ways. Noun there is no hope of success. Verb. I hope we win the game. Adjective. The situation is hopeless. Adverb. Hopefully, we will win the game. Be sure to learn which suffixes or endings are used for different parts of speech. For example, O-U-S. I C, F U L, and L E S S make adjectives, while I O N and N E S S make nouns. Prepositions are among the hardest things for English learners to remember. For example, we say amused by and happy with. But we cannot say happy by. So, you should memorize the word and its preposition together as one unit instead of two separate words. Music often makes it easier to remember words or phrases. Sing along with a song. But make sure that you can remember the new vocabulary without the music, too. After all, you do not want to sing every time you try to remember something. Learn the tone of the vocabulary. Tone means the feeling the word carries with it. Tone can be positive or negative. And formal or informal. For example, the word idiotic 
means very stupid. It has a strong negative feeling and can be used as an insult. And howdy is a very informal use of hello. It is hard to learn about tone by yourself. The best way to learn the tone of vocabulary is to ask native speakers about it. There are many apps to help you learn vocabulary. They use a way of learning called spaced repetition. For example, an app might show you a new word seven times in one day when the word is new, but then show you the word only once a week after you know it better. English in a minute, news words, and words and their stories are three programs that center on vocabulary on VOA Learning English. But you can learn vocabulary from any VOA Learning English program. Most of all, remember to be active instead of passive. Make yourself think and use new words. And you will see your vocabulary grow day by day. I'm Andrew Smith. And I'm Dorothy Gundy. And now, words and their stories from VOA Learning English. On this show, we explore words and expressions a little more deeply. We give you synonyms, words that mean close to the same thing. And we use the expressions in a conversation. Today, we talk about our hands. More specifically, our thumbs. Most of us have one thumb and four fingers on each hand. Our thumbs let us perform certain tasks. But what if all our fingers were replaced with thumbs? Those tasks we normally perform with ease would become much more difficult. In fact, we would lose the ability to do many things with our hands. Our movements would become careless and clumsy. We would drop things all the time. And that is what the saying, to be all thumbs, means. If I am all thumbs, I lack grace with my hands. I am klutzy, so people might call me a klutz. They might also call me butterfingers. Imagine your fingers are coated in butter. They would be very slippery, and it would be hard to pick things up. Now let's hear the expression, to be all thumbs, in a conversation between two friends. Hey, I'm planning a surprise party for Nicholas. I'm bringing the food and ice, and Cassidy is bringing the drinks, about 50 bottles of wine and lemonade. Can you bring the cake? I have a better idea. I'll pick up the drinks. Why don't you ask Cassidy to bring the cake? Why? Cassidy is all thumbs. She'll end up dropping everything, and then we won't have drinks at the party. Good call. She is pretty clumsy. Actually, at the last party, she dropped the cake. On second thought, I'll have her bring the ice. If she drops the bags of ice, it'll only help break it up. Very smart. And that's all the time we have for this Words and Their Stories. Until next time, I'm Ana Mateo.
Thank you, Anna. I'm Dan Friedel, and you're listening to the Learning English Broadcast. We're joined now by Anna Mateo. Anna, this week's episode brought a number of funny images to mind. Nice job. Thanks, Dan. Yeah, you're right. I can just imagine a person who has all thumbs instead of one thumb and four fingers on each hand. I would also not want to have my hands covered in butter. Anna, let me tell you, I like to bake, but I'm a pretty messy baker. When you have your hands covered in butter, it is easy to make mistakes, like drop eggshells into the cake mixture. That makes the cake come out a bit crunchy. Oh, Dan, I am so sorry about your cake. Hopefully only you noticed the extra crunch. In general, Dan, I am pretty clumsy, not just with my hands, but walking. I have fallen out of chairs. Yeah, I'm a bit clumsy. So don't feel too bad. Thanks. That does make me feel better. We all make mistakes. However, I still did want to say something positive about thumbs. We may have a negative saying about them, but they are so important. I was cutting vegetables at the beginning of the year, and I cut my thumb badly. I needed to wear a bandage for two weeks. Let me tell you, I had trouble doing lots of little things, like tying my shoes. That is true. Having thumbs helps us operate tools and do so many other tasks. But having all thumbs? Well, that is a different story. Well, if thumbs could talk, Anna, they might want to have a word with you about this episode. Yes, Dan. If thumbs could talk, I think we would have a lot more to worry about than dropping things. You're right, Anna. That would be a major news story. Well, thanks for this chat. It was fun. I'm looking forward to the next time. You're welcome, Dan. Thanks for the invitation. VOA Learning English presents America's Presidents. Today we are talking about Ulysses S. Grant. He took office in 1869. But his presidency is not what made him famous. Grant is best remembered for being the commander of Union forces at the end of the Civil War. He led the United States to victory over the Confederate States of America. Many Americans also remember Grant because of the unusual story about his middle initial. When the future 18th president was born, his parents named him Hiram Ulysses Grant, but the boy was known as Ulysses. When Grant was a young man, a member of Congress appointed him to a top college the U.S. Military Academy at West Point, New York. The congressman did not know Grant personally. He thought Grant used his mother's family name, Simpson, as his middle name. So the congressman called him Ulysses S. Grant. The middle initial S became official. Years later, Grant joked, that it did not mean anything. During the Civil War, however, Grant's middle name did come to have a popular meaning. In a famous battle in the state of Tennessee, Grant's army overpowered their opponents. The Confederate general sent a note asking for the terms of surrender. In other words, what would the Union army require of them if they withdrew from the battle. General Grant replied, No terms except unconditional and immediate surrender. 
The answer did not please the Confederate general, but he agreed. In the North, people celebrated the victory. They began saying Grant's first two initials stood for unconditional surrender. Grant was born in the state of Ohio. He was the oldest of six children. Grant's father worked as a tanner, a person who makes leather from animal skin. As a boy, Grant helped his father, but he did not like the work. He said he would not do it when he was an adult. So, when Grant was a young man, his father asked West Point officials to admit his son as a student. The Grants had little money to pay for the boy's college education, but they knew he was intelligent and skilled, and West Point was free. In exchange for their education, West Point graduates serve in the military. Grant probably did not seem like a soldier. He was quiet and sensitive. He hated seeing men die in battle, and he questioned the value of war. But he turned out to be an excellent military leader. After he graduated from West Point, he fought in the Mexican War and earned medals for bravery. He was given more power and added responsibilities. However, Grant was lonely. Early in his career, he married Julia Dent, the sister of a college friend. He was devoted to Julia and their four children. But his family could not come with Grant on all his deployments for the military. They were separated for years at a time. Without his family nearby, Grant began having problems with money. Some people said he also drank too much alcohol. One day, Grant resigned from the Army. He returned home to his family. At first, he tried to farm, but he could not make enough money. Then he tried other jobs. Finally, he asked his father for help. His father gave him a job, but it was the one the young Grant swore he never wanted, working in a leather shop. Then things took a surprising turn. The Civil War began. The Union needed experienced military leaders. Grant accepted a position leading a difficult group of troops. He was able to train them and earn their respect. Quickly, Grant's public image as a military leader grew. He won major victories for the Union in battles at Fort Donelson, Tennessee, and Vicksburg, Mississippi. The president at the time, Abraham Lincoln, liked the way Grant planned the battles. He also liked that Grant did everything he could to win. Grant permitted so many of his soldiers to die that his critics gave him a nickname, The Butcher. Grant's methods were harsh, but effective. The Civil War effectively ended when the famous Confederate general, Robert E. Lee, surrendered to Grant at Appomattox Courthouse, Virginia. The following year, Grant was named General of the U.S. Armies. The only other person to hold that position was the military leader during the Revolutionary War, George Washington.
Like George Washington, Grant became president, although he did not really seek the position. But Republican Party leaders realized that the former general was very popular, and they knew that Grant opposed the policies of the president at the time, Andrew Johnson. So the Republicans nominated Grant as their candidate in 1868. He won easily. But Grant's popularity and ability as a military leader did not make him a successful president. Grant tried to work for the political and civil rights of African Americans, many of whom had been enslaved. One of Grant's most important acts was to support the 15th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. The measure gave African American men the right to vote. At the same time, Grant tried to give states control over their own laws. So, sometimes he used the power of the federal government to protect the rights of African Americans, and he sometimes let states use violence to prevent African Americans from exercising their rights. Grant also spoke about treating Native Americans with greater respect. He used government resources to help Native people become farmers. But other government policies helped white settlers continue to push tribes off their lands. Few Native Americans saw their lives really improve under Grant. Finally, his administration suffered because of corrupt government officials. Grant himself did not get rich from their actions, but he remained loyal to people who worked for him, even when they profited from their position. As a result of all this, Many Americans lost interest in Reconstruction and lost faith in the federal government. But Grant himself remained popular. He won a second term more easily than the first. Shortly after, the country entered a bad economic depression. Grant tried to improve the situation by supporting the gold standard. But many Americans of all backgrounds, continued to suffer. Because of the problems in his government, Grant is not remembered as one of the country's best presidents. But he is remembered as a war hero and as a kind-hearted man with an interesting life. In his last months, Grant worked nearly nonstop on writing his memoirs. Final images show him covered in a blanket and with a pen in his hand, diligently working. Grant died in 1885, a few days after the book was finished. It was a major success. It earned enough money to provide for his family for the rest of their lives. People across the country mourned the loss of Grant. More than a million and a half watched his funeral parade in New York City. He is buried there, along with his beloved wife, in a well-known memorial, popularly called Grant's Tomb. I'm Kelly Jean Kelly. And that's the Learning English broadcast for today. Thank you, Kelly, for that report. And thanks to our VOA colleagues for their work on today's program. Most importantly... Thank you for listening. For more, visit our website at learningenglish.voanews.com. I'm Katie Weaver. And I'm Dan Friedel. 